All right, welcome back everybody. Here we are, part two, natural selection. The idea of natural selection and how it has shaped species is not as crazy as you think. In this video, I've just got a couple objectives. I want to explain to you how natural selection affects the population's genotypes and phenotypes, and also describe the importance of phenotypic variation in a population. So Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, and when he did, he spent the first two chapters talking about what we would call artificial selection. Now, there's natural selection, which uses the environment to naturally select uh, which traits are more successful and which aren't. But in artificial selection, you've come to know it as selective breeding. It's when humans get involved and we act as the gatekeepers of which trait is good and which trait is bad. But that only favors us, right? We're going to make your beef tastier, we're going to make your fruit bigger, and those ideas. Um, I don't know. It's it's a good book. I'm glad somebody else wrote it. or uh, I'm, well, You know what I mean. I'm glad somebody else read it to tell me that it was such a good book because I actually had a hard time uh, reading this. It was It's like Shakespearean science. He's, he's, some of these sentences take up half a page just to get through without any punctuation. It's incredible. Hard read, but it's an interesting read from the mid-1800s and his view on the way natural selection works. That's my opinion. Anyway, artificial selection works like this. On the left-hand side, we've got what we would today have as a variation of cats. On the right-hand side are the dogs. Now, you know as well as I do, there are way more types of dogs than there are of cats. And that's because cats haven't really been selected for until recently. Cats were just a thing, right? You kept a cat around, but it's only within the past few hundred years or so we've been really excited about different variations of cats. And so artificial start selection has been taking over. On the dog side, 10,000 years ago is when the gray wolf gave rise to every dog you can think of today, whether it's the little pocket poodles, little miniature whatevers, to my 110 pound German shepherd, to mastiffs and newfies. I mean, they all of those, their common ancestor is the gray wolf. No exception. Well, in Darwin's day, you guys have Xbox. Um, we have sports. They had pigeons, right? There was a like a breeding pigeon thing going on. And who could come up with the coolest variations? So Darwin speaks heavily about the differences in the pigeon species, in the dog species, in agriculture, and livestock as how humans have selected on their own different traits to come to the front as the most beneficial for us. So if nature has been doing that for the past, I don't know, few million years, few hundred million years, billion years, look at what humans have done in the past 10,000 years. When we look at what I, I love cauliflower, I love broccoli, not a kale friend, 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 uh, nor do I like Brussels sprouts. My my life exists mostly on this side. Those and the ancestor of all of these is just a wild mustard seed, wild mustard. That's the actual picture of wild mustard. Take that in for a minute. If we had a field trip, we would not stumble along in nature, native cabbage or native Brussels sprouts, kale. I don't know how to pronounce that. Broccoli or cauliflower. It doesn't exist. We made it. We made it from using little variations of the wild mustard plant over generation, over generation, over generation until we have what we want. That shows you the power of choosing phenotypes and the variations that they have to suit whatever it is that you want out of it. This is how it works. Species reproduce. And we already know that when they do reproduce, they're going to make more offspring than can survive. Those, those offspring are each going to show so much variation between them. Some are going to be taller, shorter, wider, narrower, uh, differences in colors, differences, differences in nutrients. All of those variations then get passed on to what we would call human choice. Do you like the, the seeds in there or not? You don't like seeds? Well, we'll start grafting it off there and go from that. Uh, you like the cow with a little bit more marbling? We'll, we'll keep those aside and keep breeding them. 
And so then you have human choice. And then we take those and we reproduce them over and over again. And this is a cycle. This is a wheel. Once we reproduce them, they have a lot of offspring and we keep getting closer and closer and closer to what we would call perfection. Unfortunately, you'll never get to perfection because our tastes always change. There's always a, a new something, just like in the environment. You're never going to find a perfect species out in the environment because the environment is changing all the time. Even now rapidly with climate change, the temperatures are changing, the amount of waters are changing. So you may have it all set up as a bird, uh, but you have your own tolerance ranges. That's about to change, at least not in your lifetime, but over the population's life. So there's our mustard example. What could we say about the phenotypes? Well, the phenotypes, to begin with, uh, may have, may have like they'd be really tall, and then there's a few that would be even taller, and the most would be short. And this is the number of individuals in that population. The new phenotype is maybe we like the short ones, and so we select for the short ones. So over time. Even the longer ones are favored against, get that drop off. So there's a shift in the phenotype over time. Well, what about the genetics? Let me clear my gen. Let me screw it on my genetic thing here. Um, I don't know. We're using mustard, so let's use homozygous M, heterozygouses, and heterozyg homozygous recessive. Being tall might have been over here, like those, and there might have been a few that were homozygous recessive and these would often die. Well, if, if the shorter ones are what we wanna favor, those are the ones we want, eventually you get a total shift in a homozygous recessive and that's where we are now. You can shift the phenotype frequencies over time. Notice, and I, I just, I look for these things, that that is really the all that can exist because once you keep breeding homozygous recessive, you're never going to introduce that dominant gene. It's not like, oh, look, it, it's back. No, once you breed homozygous recessives, that's, that's all you should get. That goes back to Mendel. This works in nature too. Reproduction, they overproduce. Those overproductions show variation. All of those variations go through the cycle of life and they compete for water, space, mates, food, survival, lacking injury. And if you pass go, you collect $200, you get nature's reward and you get to reproduce. This is what Darwin saw. What he didn't know about was DNA yet. They had a few hundred years to come. So now we have to introduce the idea of mutations. Every now and again, every now and again, there is a mutation as you get ready to reproduce that gives you a little bit of a benefit. One of the best ones is the cross bill. Uh, on a, they're actually called cross bills. The mutation, instead of their beaks closing like this, makes it close like this. Not many birds could, birds could survive. That's like having a weird overbite. Well, that actually lets them get into the seeds of where they eat, and they, they're able to pull the seeds out. That's a beneficial mutation. Hair is a beneficial mutation. This little guy right here that I'm showing off with, this thumb, beneficial mutation. Not everything has one of these. Those that survive with it, reproduce, overproduce, make a bunch of variations. The best variations survive and reproduce. But mutations are not really the, the often one. These do happen, but not very often. Not, not as often as reproduction and variation do. So we always call mutations the raw material. It introduces a new trait. So light hair and dark hair have been the two. And now, boom, there's red hair. Red hair can be crazy, but might give a little bit better survival rate. Who knows why? Maybe it's more attractive to your mates. Maybe you're living in a changing red world. I don't know, but it changes the species enough and introduces a new trait that that gets mixed into all of the other traits that are now caught up in natural selection. What does that look like? It's the same, where most species favor one trait over the next, and that if the environment changes from a semi-dark world towards a semi-light world, then if this is the dark phenotype, 
and this is the light phenotype, and it's going to shift to the other side. And there's other ways this can happen, but we call this directional selection. There's three kinds. We'll get to them in a couple chapters, but that's a shift in the phenotypes. You can see it move from one to the other. A great experiment was done in the 1800s when soot from the Industrial Revolution was falling on the trees and the peppered moth was affected. You had some uh, that were light colored. You had, let's do dark, medium, and light. And they would rest on the birch bark trees. Birch bark trees are mostly white with little pieces of black. So the phenotype over here was very high for light. And then there were some mediums and then the dark population was really low because they would get picked off by the birds. But then as the environment changed, there was a shift. The soot was falling on the trees. Even through the rain, it would stick to the trees and make the trees darker. So those dark phenotypes were much more favored for it, and there was a complete shift in the phenotypic rate, uh, ratio. Well, guess what? It's, it's the same thing for genetics. If you have DD, 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 we'll do it down here too. You can see a shift in the allele frequency and the genotype frequency. We're down here um, like that. And like that, I guess I made this one too too tall, sorry. But then there was way more homozygous recessives. And then at the end of this, it all shifts toward these guys. And you're always gonna have more you're gonna always gonna have more heterozygouses than you do homozygous dominance because that little recessive can be carried, right? It's when you do your Punnett square. Even if we take this guy and mate him with that guy, you only get that guy, right? And if you mate, let's clear it all. If you mate heterozygouses, there's only one out of four that's going to be homozygous dominant and two out of four that are going to be heterozygous and only a quarter homozygous recessive. The point being that in one environment, the genotypes were favored one way, but as the environment changed, you ended up with a shift in the gene frequency. And that is really a working uh, definition of evolution. Evolution is a change in the gene frequencies over time. You can say that this is something called micro evolution. All right. The way that I've always viewed natural selection is a wheel. And you could see why in the diagram that I made is this constant wheel but it's always over a changing environment. The environment is constantly changing. So throughout time, those traits just keep, the, the motion of natural selection just keeps running through. And it's never gonna stop because the environment is always changing. All right, so here's, here's a good example of natural selection and we'll leave you with this. We now have bacteria, we have uh, pathogens that are resistant to any of the antibiotics that we throw at them. How can that be? Well, you just learned that bacteria have plasmids in chapter 20. And those little plasmids can give the bacteria a little bit of something. It can be a reproductive plasmid. It can be a detoxifier. The detoxifier is the one we want to know about because that's the one that allows it to overcome antibiotics. Some actually make the cell wall strengthen and allow it to you know, forego the lysine of its cell wall. Well, as long as you get a mutation in a population and that mutation gives it a benefit, it's going to stick around. So we think of bacteria, I don't know what you think of bacteria, but there's a lot on you right now. They're everywhere. They're smothering and covering everything we touch. They're always reproducing. So they're always every time you reproduce DNA, you run a chance of getting a mutation. So every now and again, you kick off a little mutation. Some of those bacteria are resistant. Those resistance, right? This this runs through everything we've been saying. Uh, they reproduce. They make more than they make a lot more than will survive. They have some variations, and then those with the variation that is beneficial will survive, and they'll make more, and they'll make more, and then we're back in the wheel of natural selection. How fast does that occur? It depends on the environment. 
if there's a heavy selection pressure to really kill the bacteria, it might take a while. If there's a heavy selection pressure and a lot of them have that mutation, it's not going to take a while because those individuals that survive that pressure are going to reproduce basically in a free environment because you just wiped out all of their competitors. So that evolution will happen even faster. So I've got a short video for you to watch on how fast bacteria can actually become resistant to very heavy levels of antibiotics. All right. Check. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands. And at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. Pretty cool, wasn't it? All right. So here's where we are. I think by now you understand how natural selection can affect the population's phenotypes and genotypes. And I think you do understand how important those phenotypic variations are going to be to natural selection. You saw how fast bacteria can become resistant to an antibiotic. Explain the limitations of natural selection has when preventing a species from going extinct. That's for something, that's something for you to think about. It's often said that specialization leads to extinction. We'll talk about this in class, but that's something I want you to think about. How can natural selection the beauty and the, and the forming of natural selection actually be bad for the species. I've given you all the pieces you need to answer it in this video. Okay, I hope it helped. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.